Now we're going to take on this important question of individual differences in intelligence, this basic question of who is smart. And we all have this image, uh, as we see here, of Einstein and these people that are held up as geniuses. And this is kind of, you know, I think a big issue in understanding what intelligence is because these people are kind of heralded so broadly in society as being sort of different from everybody else. Einstein was born a genius and de destined to figure out all these problems. But the truth is that, that things are actually much more a product, as we've been saying, of learning and experience, not somebody who's just kind of born that way. And again, this goes back to the growth versus fixed mindset. Uh, and this author, Thomas Apong, uh, has a very nice uh, blog about highlighting how genius, this, this kind of success at the really high level, uh, actually takes a huge amount of time and effort to really master. So he has a few quotes here. Buckminster Fuller, who is widely recognized as being a kind of genius, said, no, I'm not a genius. I'm just a tremendous bundle of experience. And so this idea, again, that, that these people who have made these big accomplishments have done so because they've spent a huge amount of time. So Mozart, for example, another widely cited example of genius, had done 3,500 hours by the time he was just six years old doing music. Even though he was very successful early on, uh, he still had put in a lot of time because his parents uh, supported his interest in music. Uh, Tiger Woods, a famous example of a genius golfer, uh, started when he was only two years old, again, encouraged by his parents. Serena and Venus Williams at three and four. Um, and, and these are examples where people really, you know, achieve this high level of success because they put in huge amounts of time and have started very early. And I think when you look at every one of these cases, these are people who have spent a lot of time uh, motivated and interested in the domain that they become a genius in. And so, again, I don't see anything in the actual evidence that indicates that people are really born as geniuses. It's really a process of learning. And again, we go back to the, the way that the brain is organized and, and the synapses and, and everything suggests that you have to devote a huge amount of learning to actually be uh, accomplished in any given particular area. And so, again, we have this notion of the, the fixed mindset, I think, has really been discredited and has been historically the way people had thought about it, intelligence. But uh, all the evidence really now does indicate that, uh, that intelligence is something that you acquire, that it comes as a result of hard work. Um, and I fundamentally believe that anybody can learn anything. Now, having said all that, there is also every indication that people do have individual differences in what I interpret as a kind of motivation to perform cognitive functions, but what gets measured as kind of general intelligence. And so we have this long history uh, going back to the early 1900s, looking at the Stanford Binet test uh, developed first by Alfred Binet, um, which was really the first IQ test. And then uh, Wexler developed a more advanced test that uh, could also be applied to adults. The first one was only for kids. And uh, Spearman really advanced this idea that there seems to be this kind of common factor, this G uh, factor that is common across many different domains, many different tests. And, and that indicates something about the individual's kind of aptitude for performing these kinds of tasks. And again, it's really important to recognize that all of these tests are tests. They're all things that people perform and we measure. And so if there is some kind of general aptitude, it's a general aptitude for succeeding at these kinds of tests. And we have to be careful about interpreting what those things mean. The full scale IQ test for the WACE uh, involves different components, subcomponents, verbal versus performance. Um, and if you come down here in the perceptual organization index, uh, there's things about kind of organizing blocks and doing matrix reasoning. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, also processing speed. So there is some kind of 
raw speed factor going on, consistent with our understanding of the importance of the prefrontal cortex and working memory, this uh, working memory component has uh, measures kind of that ability to juggle and maintain information in that short-term active state. And so that uh, we know that the working memory is very important for your kind of neural CPU. And then began, again, because of the importance of language and verbal information in programming our, our kind of cognitive abilities uh, and reasoning all being tied up with our ability to use language, um, there's a very important component of verbal uh, abilities also. And so that's kind of the most crystallized form of intelligence that shows up in this overall IQ test. So it's really an amalgam of lots of different factors and they're put together and weighted in order to come up with some kind of overall estimate. And one of the important features of these kinds of IQ tests is that they're standardized such that a score of 100 uh, is always means kind of the average and they update uh, the way that these tests are scored based on kind of how people are doing to make sure that that score of 100 remains average. And it turns out that actually in, uh, there's a strange effect where over the each decade, people's performance on these tests is actually improving. Our actual measure, raw measures of IQ are getting better and better. Uh, but uh, again, these tests continue to be renormalized to this 100 average uh, level. Um, Another important feature of an IQ test is its reliability. Does, uh, does the score you get on one time you take the test kind of match the score you get the next time you take the test? That's one of the most important features of any kind of uh, standardized test like this is that it sort of gives you something, whatever it is, it gives you something reliable about the person. If it can't do that, then it's not really a very useful test. And then the most important thing about the IQ test is its predictive validity. And this is where it kind of gets its uh, overall recognition as being an important kind of measure is that it actually tells you something about later performance. So a lot of times these are given to kids. Um, and then later on, you kind of track uh, based on different IQ scores that you get here, uh, what kind of grade SAT test overall educational outcome you get later on in school. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it's, it's correlated with uh, health, uh, which is, is interesting. There are a lot of other factors that influence these scores, including you know, your socioeconomic status, uh, the wealth of your parents, all these other kinds of things. And so um, we don't know, again, because of these third variable problems, how much those other factors might be affecting uh, the overall validity of these effects. The predictive validity remains in different kind of subpopulations or subgroups of people. So overall, it does seem to be measuring something important. But again, what is that? What, what, are, what are these particular tests telling us?